director of the Jesuits. Recently, at a press conference in the Stormont Parliament buildings, I dealt with a political statement made by Bishop Castle Daly of the Roman Catholic hierarchy in Ireland. The bishop had put forth four propositions. Number one, that Mrs. Thatcher, the British Prime Minister's art, art, art statement rejecting the proposals of the New Ireland Forum for a United Ireland played into the hands of the IRA. Two, that all unionists who rejoiced at that statement should be bracketed with the IRA as extremists. Three, that Roman Catholics in Northern Ireland were denied real rights and democracy. Four, that the Dublin government had just as much right in the North as had the British government. That final proposition, by the way, is a treasonable doctrine which would morally justify an invasion by the South of the North of Ireland. Commenting, I called the bishop the Black Pope of the Republican movement. The press men present threw up their hands in seeming horror. But none of them knew who the Black Pope was. I explained that the Black Pope was the name given uh, to the head of the Jesuit order, the most powerful order within the Roman Catholic system. In an aside, I might say that the bishop should have felt very pleased that I had elevated him so high up in the hierarchy of the church to which he belongs. Then, when I explained to the press who the black pope really was, the head of the Jesuits, they again said, who are the Jesuits? And I described them as the Gestapo of the Roman Catholic Church, the front men to carry out the Pope's orders throughout Christendom. Again the press men represented threw up their hands in seeming horror and uh, said this was a terrible thing uh, to say about any order within the Roman Catholic Church. But what are the facts? I quote from the Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmund Pollis. I'm giving a quotation from the Reform, which is what the press of the Spanish dictator Franco published on the 3rd of May, 1945, the day of Hitler's death. Quote, Adolf Hitler son of the Catholic Church, died while defending Christianity. It is therefore understandable that words cannot be found to lament over his death, when so many were found to exalt his life. Over his mortal remains stands his victorious moral figure. With the palm of the martyr, God gives Hitler the laurels of victory. End of the quotation. Then in page 166 of the same book, we read the statement of Walter Skellenberg, former chief of German counter-espionage, who had the complete confidence of Hitler. After the war, Schellenberg wrote, quote, The SS organization that is the Gestapo, had been constituted by Himmler according to the principles of the Jesuit order. Their regulations and the spiritual exercises prescribed by Ignatius of Loyola were the model Himmler tried to copy exactly. The Reichsführer SS Himmler's title as Supreme Chief of the SS was to be the equivalent of the Jesuits' general. 
end of the quotation. Let me give a final quotation from the leading Jesuit, Michael Scomios, who eventually became a cardinal in the church. He says, the National Socialist Movement, that is the fascist movement of Hitler, is the most vigorous and massive protest against the spirit of the 19th and 20th centuries. A compromise between the Catholic faith and liberal thinking is impossible. Nothing is more contrary to Catholicism than democracy. The reawakened meaning of strict authority opens up again the way to the real interpretation of ecclesiastical authority. The mistrust of liberty is founded on the Catholic doctrine of original sin. The National Socialist Commandments and those of the Catholic Church have the same aim. End of the quotation. These quotations alone prove conclusively that my definition of the Jesuits was a correct one. As a result of this controversy, many questions have been asked and of course a whole series of attacks have been made upon my person and also upon my stand. So I believe it is incumbent upon me to deal with the Jesuits, to say something of their history, something of their doctrines, and something of their program. On one of the walls of the Church of the Jesuits in Rome, there is a unique plaster cast. It depicts one of the saints of the Roman Catholic Church, Ignatius Loyola himself, with his foot on the neck of Protestantism. In St. Peter's itself, there is a colossal idol of the same Roman saint. He is depicted there in monkish gown and cowl. A large open book rests on his left arm. On the first page are the words in Latin, To the greater glory of God. On the opposite page, also in Latin, Constitutions of the Society of Jesus. The devil stands before him with a Jesuit's face, hair divided as long tongues of fire, left hand clenched and held close to the mouth by the right holds a closed book with the fingers within it. A serpent with awful head and teeth is beneath. These two pieces of a Roman idolatrous sculpture are very significant. This Roman manufactured saint, Ignatius Loyola, was the founder of the Jesuit order, or the Society of Jesus, as he blasphemously called it. Its purpose is to stamp on the neck of Protestantism. The idol in St. Peter's has monk, devil, and serpent united. Excellent representatives of the devilish character of the Jesuit. Every Jesuit is outwardly a monk, inwardly a devil, and altogether a serpent. It is the Jesuits who control Rome's ecumenical movement. When the second Pope John the Twenty Third set up the Vatican Secretariat for Unity, he made Cardinal Bia, a German Jesuit, its president. This is deeply significant. As a leading Jesuit cardinal, Bia had at his disposal the great aspiring in Europe, his own society, to feed back to him all the vital information concerning the leadership and vulnerability of the great Protestant denominations, which he was aiming to subvert to the papacy. The success was astounding. Archbishop Fisher visited the Pope and appointed an association 
with his successor, Archbishop Ramsey, then Archbishop of York, one Canon Pauley of Ely Cathedral, to be personal representative of Canterbury and York at the Secretariat, over which Bia presides in Rome. Cardinal Bia was also received at Lambeth Palace by Dr. Ramsey, and no doubt from the Vatican side was responsible for Dr. Ramsey's visit to the Pope. Those visits herald a succession of visits by Archbishops of Canterbury. Dr. Fisher was the first in a long queue of professed Protestant church leaders who lined up at the Vatican to slapper on the Pope's slippers. These included Dr. Jackson of the Southern Baptist Convention of the United States of America, Dr. Lichtenberger, presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church of the USA, a president of the British Methodist Conference, and Dr. A.C. Craig, moderator of the Church of Scotland. In Ireland, another Jesuit priest, Michael Hurley, was the leader in subverting the main Protestant denominations, to Rome. As far back as 1963, he issued a book called Praying for Unity, in which he made it crystal clear that the ultimate purpose of the January week of prayer was the union of all Protestant denominations with Rome under the sovereign leadership of the Pope. His Jesuitical cunning was demonstrated by his success in obtaining for his book introductory messages by George Otto Sims, Church of Ireland, Archbishop of Dublin at that time. W. A. Montgomery, moderator of the Irish Presbyterian Church at that time. And Frederick E. Hill, president of the Irish Methodist Church at that time. The only Protestant church in Ireland attacked by this Jesuit production was the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster, of which I am honored to be moderator. One of the contributors was priest Dennis Fall, soon to be known as the infamous Republican apologist and reviler of the Royal Ulster Constabulary. As can be expected, the book was the usual concoction of lies in which all Jesuits revel. We wrote to the author challenging him on the issue, but he couldn't even reply. He couldn't answer. He was a peddler of lies. Of course, any man who blasphemously claims to turn a pancake or wafer in the bath into Jesus Christ and forgive sins could write or claim anything. What has been described by the Church of Ireland Gazette as a representative ecumenical gathering in Drogheda was organized by the same Jesuit Hurley. The meeting was held in a convent school of the Roman Catholic Presentation Sisters, and clergy of the Irish Episcopal Church, the Church of Ireland, the Irish Presbyterian Church, and the Irish Methodist Church joined with Romanists in unity discussions. Two Irish Presbyterian professors, Barclay and McFadden, took a prominent part in that discussion. A few days later, the hypocrite Professor Barclay wrote to the press declaring there was no retreat to Rome. How naive does he think Ulster Protestants are? In England, the Jesuit Thomas Corbishley was the leader. The fact that he preached from the pulpit of Westminster Abbey showed how powerful his influence was. The tremendous protest in which we had the honor of taking part, must have been a very bitter pill for him to swallow. The far-reaching effect of that protest can be gauged from the following extract of the National Daily Paper of the Sun. I quote from January the 24th, 1966. Today the Pope told more than 7,000 pilgrims gathered in St. Peter's Square. 
We must pray for the unity of all separated Christians. As you know, the problem of the union of all Christians is of grave importance and great immediacy. But we must confront it, even if it gives rise to so many difficulties, and perhaps the hour is near. The paper comments, the Pope's words about so many difficulties, some Vatican officials believe, may have referred to such incidents as the one in London on Friday night, when a group of die-hard Protestants demonstrated outside Westminster Abbey while a Jesuit priest was preaching there. The Anglican Bishop Hudson of Hereford joined the Jesuit Corbishley at a unity service in Birmingham. Later I debated Corbishley at Queen's University. In the light of these facts, that the Jesuits spearheaded Rome's ecumenical movement to take over the main Protestant denominations, we would do well to take a closer view of the Jesuits and their working, especially in view of the storm of protest that has come about when I called Carol Daly the Black Pope of the Republican movement. We will consider then the start, the sign, the system, the secrecy, and the strategy of the Jesuits. First then, the start of the Jesuits. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Society of Jesus, was born eight years after the great German reformer Martin Luther. He belonged to an ancient Spanish family. He became a soldier and was severely wounded in one engagement in which he greatly distinguished himself. During the tedious illness resulting from his wound, he read Roman Catholic literature. This resulted in his embracing a stern asceticism. For a time he lived in a cave and took to extreme penances. This led to morbid broodings. His imagination ran riot. On one occasion we are informed he saw the Holy Spirit in the form of three notes closely bound together, hanging on a stock. And to his holy eyes, moreover, the host was transformed into the true God-man. The fanaticism resulting from such visions inspired Ignatius and his followers to diabolical deeds on behalf of the Roman Catholic system. During this time, Loyola conceived the plan of a new society which was to combat the Reformation. On August the 15th, 1534, Ignatius and six associates dedicated themselves in the crypt of the Notre Dame de Montmartre. In 1537, they offered themselves to the Pope and declared that they would raise a mighty army of holy knights whose sole aim would be to overthrow all the enemies of the Church of Rome. Pope Paul III gladly accepted their services, especially as the order swore explicit military obedience, not merely canonical, to him and gave all its services entirely without money and without price. A papal bill which bore the title, Raised to the Government of the Church Militant, constituted the order on September the 27th, 1540. The bill declared that the persons enrolled were constituted an army to bear the standard of the cross, to wield the arms of God, to serve the only Lord God and the Roman Pontiff, his vicar on earth. So started the most murderous and diabolical society to whom the Roman harlot ever gave birth. Secondly, the sign of the Jesuits. When the original group met in the crypt of Notre Dame, de Montmartre, rose from their knees, Ignatius pointed to the letters on the altar, IHS. These stand for Jesus, Hamadon, Salvatore, Jesus the Savior of mankind, and they shall henceforth be the model of our institution. IHS is a sign of the Jesuits. These letters do not stand for what Ignatius affirmed. 
They are, in fact, the pagan mystical symbol of the Egyptian trinity. Isis, Horus, and Zeep, the mother, child, and father of the gods. No honest person could imagine that this double sense is accidental. IHS pay the semblance of a tribute to Christianity, but they are in reality the substance of devil worship. The cloven hoof is upon them. I would advise everyone to read Hislop's two Babylons on this subject. Yes, and wherever these mystic letters, IHS, the sign of the Jesuits are found, be sure that sooner or later those using them will be revealed as doing the work of the Jesuits. These are the first symbols erected in Protestant churches by the Romanizing clergy. Let them be kept out of every Protestant church, for the substance will follow the sign as sure as night follows day. Three, the system of the Jesuits. The Jesuitical system is one of dissimulation, hypocrisy, and immorality. A book called The Secreta Monitor, a copy of which is in the British Museum, contains instructions for the operation of the Jesuit system. The book is a masterpiece of diabolical deception. As might be expected, the book has been repudiated by the Jesuits. In its 18th chapter, it states curiously enough that this repudiation must take place if it should be discovered. The evidence of the genuineness of the book is incontrovertible. What is more, the Jesuits have always worked along the lines laid down in its corrupting pages. Jesuitism has three great governing principles. One, the doctrine of probability. Two, the doctrine of philosophical sin. Three, the doctrine of the direction of attention. One, the doctrine of probability. The Jesuits' own interpretation of it is that when upon any moral question, two different opinions are entertained by any celebrated casuists, of which opinions the one is more probable and in conformity with the law, the other less probable but more agreeable to our desires. We may lawfully put the latter in practice. Even of two contradictory probable opinions, says the Jesuit Paul Lehman, touching the legality or illegality of any human action, every one may follow in practice or in action that which he should prefer, although it may appear to the agent himself less probable in theory. The Jesuit Gasnevi goes further even than this, for he says that whosoever says that the law is not binding cannot sin. In other words, any plausible excuse whatever is a sufficient excuse for sin. Secondly, the doctrine of philosophical sin. By this doctrine the Jesuits meet any action contrary to the dictates of nature and right reason may be done by a person who is ignorant of the written law of God or doubtful of its meaning. Ignorance or doubt, therefore, according to this doctrine, alters the character of sin. Three, the doctrine of the direction of attention. The meaning of this doctrine is that actions intrinsically evil and directly contrary to the divine laws may be innocently performed by those who have so much power over their own minds as to join even ideally a good end to the wicked action contemplated. That is to say, let a man only stifle his conscience or divert his thoughts for the time from his sin to some other object or seek some good end, and he may do what he will. By these doctrines, the Jesuits in their writings show how every one of the Ten Commandments can be broken without sin. It was Cardinal Manning, running true to Jesuitical principles, who said of the authors of the Jesuit gunpowder plot, 
While on earth they wore the garb of felons, in heaven they stand arrayed in white and crowned. Here they are arrayed in a dark as malefactors. There they sit by the throne of the Son of God. The late Lord Palmerston once said, The presence of the Jesuits in any country, Catholic or Protestant, is likely to breed social disturbance. A French Roman Catholic priest, Arnold, warned, Do you wish to provoke revolution? To produce the total ruin of your country? Call in the Jesuits. The character of the order can be proved by the historical fact that up to the year 1860, no fewer than 70 times it had been expelled from countries in which it had been working. What is more, in 1773, Pope Clement XIV abolished the order altogether. Pope Clement met with a cruel death as a result. In 1814, Pope Pius VII restored the order, declaring that if any should again attempt to abolish it, he would incur the indignation of Almighty God and of the holy apostles Peter and Paul. Jesuit Ray has spawned the whole of the Irish Republican murder movement. The IRA has been taught and has imbibed its principles. Let me give you three quotations from leading Jesuit theologians. Martin Beacon, in his work on theology, has the following passage. Every subject may kill his prince when the latter has taken possession of the throne as a usurper. And history teaches, in fact, that in all nations, those who kill such tyrants are treated with the greatest honor. But even when the ruler is not a usurper, but a prince who has by right come to the throne, he may be killed as soon as he oppresses his subjects with improper taxation, sells the judicial offices, and issues ordinances in a tyrannical manner, for his own particular benefit. End of the quotation. Of that terrorist organization, justifying their campaign of murder, are but echoes of the principles of the Jesuit order. We turn now to the secret of the Jesuits. My fourth point. Bishop Wordsworth, an eminent Church of England divine, and for some years the Bishop of Lincoln uncovers the secrecy of the Jesuits in the, the exposure of a document used by them in their early days to compel Protestants to submit to Mother Church. This makes very illuminating reading. Roman Catholic Confession, publicly prescribed and proposed to Protestants on their admission to the Roman Catholic Church. 1. We confess that we have been brought from heresy to the true saving Roman Catholic faith by the singular care of our supreme governors, spiritual and temporal, and by the diligence and aid of our masters, the fathers of the order of Jesuits. And we desire to certify this by our vows to the world at large. Two, we confess that the Pope of Rome is head of the Church and cannot err. Three, we confess and are certain that the Pope of Rome is Vicar of Christ and has plenary power of remitting and retaining the sins of all men according to his will, of thrusting them down to hell and of excommunicating them. Four, we confess that whatever new thing the Pope ordains, whether it be in Scripture or not in Scripture, and whatever he commands is divine, and therefore ought to be held by lay people in greater esteem 
than the precepts of the living God. Five, we confess that the most holy Pope ought to be honored by all with divine honor, with greater genuflection due to Christ himself. Six, we confess and assert that the Pope as our most holy father is to be obeyed in all things without any exception, and that such heretics as contravene his orders are not only to be burnt, but to be delivered body and soul to hell. Seven, we confess that the reading of Holy Scripture is the origin of heresy and schism and the source of blasphemy. Eight, we confess that to invoke saints, male and female, to honor their images, to kneel before them, to make pilgrimage to them, to light candles to them, is good, pious, holy, and useful. Nine, we confess that every priest is much greater than the mother of God, the blessed Virgin Mary, who once brought forth Christ, and once only. But a priest of Rome, not only when he wills, but whenever he wills, offers and creates Christ, and consumes him when created. Ten, we confess that to celebrate Masses, and to distribute alms, and to pray for the dead, is useful. Eleven, we confess that the Pope has power of changing Scripture, and of adding to it, and taking from it according to his will. Twelve, we confess that souls after death are purified in purgatory, and that the masses of priests are useful to deliver them from it. Thirteen, we confess that to receive the Eucharist under one kind is good and salutary, and to receive it under both is heretical and damnable. Fourteen, we confess and assert that they who receive under one kind receive the whole Christ with flesh and blood, with the divinity and bones, but that they who receive under both only enjoy and eat bare bread. Fifteen, we confess that there are seven true and real sacraments. Sixteen, we confess that God is honored in images, and through them is acknowledged by men. Seventeen, we confess that Mary the Blessed Virgin is worthy of greater honor than men and angels, than Christ himself, the Son of God. Eighteen, we confess that the Blessed Virgin Mary is Queen of Heaven, and reigns together with her son, and that her son ought to act in all things according to her will. Nineteen, we confess that the bones of the saints have great virtue, and therefore ought to be honored by men, and chapels ought to be built for them. Twenty, we confess that the Roman doctrine is Catholic, pure, divine, saving, ancient, and true and the Protestant, false, erroneous, blasphemous, accursed, heretical, pernicious, seditious, and fabulous. Since, therefore, entirely and fully, in all its developments, the Roman doctrine under one kind is good and salutary, therefore we curse all those who brought us up in the country in pious heresy under both kinds. We pronounce our parents accursed, who educated us in that heretical faith. We curse those also who excited in us any doubts concerning the Roman Catholic faith, and those also who served us with that accursed cup. Yea, we curse ourselves and pronounce ourselves accursed, because we partook in that heretical cup, which we ought not to have tasted. 21. We confess that Holy Scripture is imperfect, and a dead letter, until it is explained by the Supreme Pontiff, and allowed by him to be read by the laity. 22. We confess that one Mass of a Roman priest is more useful than a hundred and more Protestant sermons. Wherefore we curse those books which we have read, containing that heretical and blasphemous doctrine. We extend our curse to all our own works, performed by us in heresy, 
that they may not bring anything upon us in the last day in the divine presence. All these things we do with sincere heart, affirming that the Church of Rome in these and like articles is most true with a solemn recantation of that other heretical doctrine. In your hearing, honorable men and matrons, young men and virgins who are here present, we swear also that we will never return to the heresy under both kinds as long as we live, although it were allowed or shall be allowed to us to do so. We swear also that as long as a drop of blood remains in our veins, we will persecute that accursed Protestant doctrine by all means in our power, secretly and openly, by violence and stratagem, by word and deed, even with the sword. Finally, we swear, in the divine presence and in that of angels and of yourselves, that we will never depart from this saving and divine Roman Catholic Church, and never will return to the accursed Protestant heresy, nor embrace it. This is the true theist of Jesuitry. No wonder Nicolini, the historian of the order, states, Draw the character of the Jesuit as he seems in London, and you will not recognize the portrait of the Jesuit in Rome. The Jesuit is a man of circumstances, despotic in Spain, constitutional in England, republican in Paraguay, bigot in Rome, idolater in India. He will assume and act out in his own person all those different features by which men are usually distinguished from each other. He will accompany the gay women of the world to the theater, and will share in the excess of the debauchee. With solemn countenance, he will take his place by the side of the religious man at church, or revel in the tavern with the glutton or sot. He dresses in all garbs, speaks all languages, knows all customs, is present everywhere, though nowhere recognized. And all this it would seem, O oh, monstrous blasphemy, for the greater glory of God. The Jesuits backed the Inquisition with all its barbarous and elaborate system of tortures and murders, putting to death millions of people. The Jesuits reckoned it among the glories of their order that Loyola himself, supported by a special memorial, to the Pope, a petition to reorganize that cruel and abhorred tribunal, the Inquisition. Under the shadow of that hellish monster, the infernal flames of the most vile persecution were stoked, while the Jesuits looked on with a sinister and diabolical smile across their faces. The Jesuitical oath, which of course they deny, but nevertheless faithfully practice its obligation, is as follows. I now, in the presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed St. John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles St. Peter and St. Paul, and all the saints, sacred hosts of heaven, and to you, my ghostly Father, the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, founded by St. Ignatius Loyola, in the pontification of Paul III, and continued to the present, do by the womb of the Virgin, the matrix of God, and the rod of Jesus Christ, declare and swear that His Holiness the Pope is Christ's Vice Regent, and is the true and only head of the Catholic or Universal Church throughout the world and that by virtue of the keys of binding and loosening, given to His Holiness by our Savior, Jesus Christ, He hath power to depose heretical kings, princes, states, commonwealths, and governments, all being illegal without His sacred confirmation, and they may be safely destroyed. Therefore, to the utmost of my power, I will defend this doctrine and His Holiness' right and custom against the usurpers of the heretical or Protestant authority whatsoever 
especially the Lutheran Church of Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, and the now pretending authority and churches of England and Scotland, and the branches of the same now established in Ireland, and on the continent of America and elsewhere, and all adherents in regard that they may be usurped and heretical, opposing the sacred mother church of Rome. I do now denounce and disown any allegiance as due to any heretical king, prince, or state, named Protestant or liberals, or obedience to any of their laws, magistrates, or officers. I do further declare that the doctrine of the churches of England and Scotland, of the Calvinists, Huguenots, and others of the name of Protestants or liberals, to be damnable, and they themselves to be damned who will not forsake the same. I do further declare that I will help, assist, and advise all or any of His Holiness's agents in any place where I shall be, in Switzerland, Germany, Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, England, Ireland, or America, or in any other kingdom or territory I shall come to and do my utmost to extirpate the heretical Protestant or liberal doctrines to destroy all their pretended powers, legal or otherwise. I do further promise and declare that notwithstanding I am dispensed with to assume any religion heretical for the propagation of the Mother Church's interests, to keep secret and private all her agents' counsels from time to time as they entrust me, and not to divulge directly or indirectly, by word or circumstance whatever, but to execute all that shall be proposed, given in charge, or discovered unto me by you my ghostly father, or any of this sacred convent. I do further promise and declare that I will have no option or will of my own, or any mental reservation whatever, even as a corpse, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope and of Jesus Christ, that I will go to any part of the world whithersoever I shall be sent. End of the Jesuitical Oath. We come now finally to the strategy of the Jesuits. Their first strategy is to completely control the papacy. Since their restoration in 1814, the Jesuits have sought to control the papacy. This they have largely succeeded in accomplishing. So great is the power of the general of the order that as we have seen, he is called not only by Protestants, but by Roman Catholics the Black Pope. He is in fact the Pope maker or breaker, as the case may be. Many of the influential societies of the Church are subservient to the Jesuits. Among these are the Redemptorists, a suborder of the Jesuits, who act willingly or unwillingly as the serving brothers, the road makers, and the laborers for the Jesuits the St. Vincent de Paul Society, the Brothers of Christian Doctrine, the Brothers of the Congregation of the Holy Virgin, beside many female branches in schools, convents, and hospitals throughout the whole world. Second strategy, infiltration. Dean Good in his book, Rome's Tactics, ably deals with the Jesuit infiltration of the Church of England. He shows how Jesuits have become professedly members and ministers in the Church of England, that in the guise of Anglican priests and laymen, they might undermine the Protestantism of that Church. For their work in this direction, they have been praised by the papacy. The other main Protestant churches have also been infiltrated in the same way, and their takeover by Rome carefully prepared for. The third strategy, conditioning, by character assassination, they seek to silence every voice raised in exposure of their aims. Where they have power, they remove by murder their opponents. They are adept in the use of the poison cup and the murder dagger. The Jesuits' defense and support of the Inquisition is a well-known historical fact. By controlling the press and broadcasting, the process of conditioning the people is skillfully manipulated. Every Protestant should ask in view of these facts, can I continue to trust 
those Protestant leaders who are continually under the influence of Jesuit priests in the ecumenical dialogue. An illustration of this is found in the newsletter of the 4th of this month, 1984, where three Protestant ministers show themselves to the Jutes of the Jesuit order. The Reverend Harold Good, Methodist. The Reverend Tom Craig, Presbyterian. And the Reverend Noel Mackey, Church of Ireland. Attacking me for calling the Jesuits the Gestapo of the Roman Church. These clergymen go on. I quote, It is our personal experience that members of the Society of Jesus, Jesuits, in Northern Ireland, are indeed dedicated to their calling to commit themselves to Christ and His work through service to the community. In particular, we know that members of the society have made an outstanding contribution toward the healing of division in our province and have earned the trust and respect of Catholics and Protestants alike. These three clergymen are dukes of the Roman Catholic Church and dukes of the Jesuit order. They have swallowed the bait, hook, line, and sinker, and have now become self-appointed advocates of Jesuitry and defenders of the Jesuits. How the Jesuits must sit back and laugh when they see how successful they have been in their operation. Rome's tactics. She asked for toleration some 100 years ago. She was so innocent, she said, was wrong to treat her so. It really seemed a pity that England should remember such trifles as the Smithfield Fires and Guido Fox November. Are senators imagining there really was a change? Admitted her to Parliament and gave her system range. She took her seat so modestly and seemed so very quiet that many people wondered at the anti popish riot. But then, as now and ever, the woman wore a mask, a prostitutorium, was to subjugate her task. The first she has accomplished. The church has gone astray, but subjugation turns the scale a bit the other way. She says, my church is holy. My popes are holy too. My fathers, brothers, monks, and nuns. What holy things they do. The evils you may hear of may fill you with disgust, but no, the holiness of whom may never be discussed. I ask for toleration. You give it, but I give. No toleration where I come. All perish if I live. And o'er the sleeping country, I pass with lengthy strides. For if I conquer Britain, I have no foes beside. What say you, men of Britain? You know the woman well. A perjured thing, a murderess. A woe unspeakable. Flighting the fairest country, which bends beneath her sway. Pray answer. Will you take her within your homes today? Stand up then, stand together. Stand out and make her known. For where she comes a sitting, she never comes alone. She comes with revolution and anarchy and change. For thought itself is fettered where the scarlet woman reigns. No blustering crowd is needed. We meet our foes like men. Hear what they say and claim the right. To have our say again, would God our feeble voices were steeped in living power to rouse our fellow countrymen in this insipid hour? God hold the lives of any who mount above the crowd with honest heart and burning lip amid Rome's curses loud. He sitteth king upon the floods, and on a given day one of his mighty seas shall sweep that godless thing away. The timely words of Mrs. M. A. Chaplin. This brings me to the end of this tip on the Jesuits, the black pope and his murder men. I trust you will get many copies of this tip, that you will give it the widest 
possible circulation, so that truth and its light will dispel the darkness and the falsehood, and that Ulster Protestants especially will know exactly who the Jesuits are, who the black Pope is, and what is the origin, and what is the strategy, and what is the goal of the Jesuit order in Northern Ireland. And those Protestant clergymen who are dupes of the Jesuitical system, who are seeking to undermine and betray our Protestant faith and heritage, spurn them as a plague, obey the scriptures, come out from their churches and from their associations, and stand true to God in this evil day of apostasy and declension. The Church of Rome thinks that through the ecumenical movement she will take over the Protestants of this land. Let her know that there are 7,000, even in this day, who haven't bowed the knee to the papal bill. And with the sword of God and the strength of God, we will resist to the death her machinations, idolatry, tyranny, priestcraft, and popedom. May God make us faithful unto death, and then we shall receive the crown of life.